Welcome everybody to our webinar today around detecting safety signals in pharmacovigilance data with Data IQ. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. The session is being recorded and will be available on the Bright Talk platform shortly after this recording. Please use the Q&A chat at any time to ask questions and we will answer these in a Q&A discussion at the end of the session. Um, today, you're going to hear from three speakers, myself, Kelsey McCloche, I am the Life Sciences AI Solutions Director for Data IQ, Matt Pickford, who is one of our sales engineers in the UK, also with Data IQ, and Georgia Koyalis, a senior data scientist at Data IQ as well. So before I begin into what we're going to demo, just to set the stage a bit, the, the premise of modern clinical trial phases was really born from a transformative amendment in 1962, which is most notable and many people don't realize that it's the first time that the FDA required proof of efficacy for a drug manufacturer to market and sell a drug, something that was never before enforced, even though they did have to show signals of safety. In fact, a drug manufacturer could put a drug out on the market, and if the FDA didn't respond within 60 days, it was free for use. This law was actually driven and is now called the Drug Efficacy Amendment because of a drug called thalidomide, which caused the death and birth de defects of tens of thousands of babies, even though at the time it was marketed in Europe as completely safe for any indication. Notably, it was not used in the FDA because an FDA medical reviewer, Francis Kelsey, refused to allow it to be marketed because of lack of efficacy. This was long before the birth defects were detected. While it's almost a footnote now compared to the requirement of effectiveness in the drug development process, this law is also what allows the requirement that the FDA and other regulatory bodies can report and monitor adverse events that occur post approval of drug development processes. So on that note, what is pharmacovigilance? Who defines this as the science around detecting, assessing, understanding, and preventing serious adverse effects or adverse reactions that are due to a medicine or a vaccine? This has notably become much more of public interest as we have seen evidence of adverse events reported in this global pandemic that we have all experienced in the last few years. But a view of this over the last 10 years, if we look at drug safety in post-marketing, while much of the innovation and modern AI and data science initiatives are dominated around the concept of bringing drugs to market more efficiently and more safely, there's a lot less attention on what happens post-approval. But in recent studies, in a study from 2017 to 2019, of almost 200 drug recalls, about 15% of those were due to labeling issues. The remaining were due to quality issues, further inspiring the need for good manufacturing and good pharmacovigilance practices. During that same time frame, there was about 500 safety-related label changes to drugs that were on the market. And now if you compare that to just the first four months of this year into 2022, there's already been 255 safety related label changes that have been submitted and reported for drugs on the market. So we see a dramatic increase in both the detection and actions taken due to detecting adverse events in real world data at post clinical trials. Most notably, another study found that the chance or the, the chance of a change to the warning or contraindication is almost 50% higher for drugs that were on what's called an expedited or fast track accelerated approval pathway. Again, notably, the COVID-19 vaccines were on this path and it's frequently requested by drug manufacturers, particularly when there is a therapeutic that really addresses highly demanding public health crisis. So many more companies might use these accelerated pathways to more efficiently get their drugs to market, but there has been an increase in safety related changes for those expedited drugs. 
Given the rise of the importance of this data as drugs continually have to be monitored and as new therapeutics are becoming more precise, we begin to see precision medicine. The complexity of both therapeutics and the populations we're treating are growing. It's an essential business function to detect drug risks and prevent patient harm, not only during the clinical trial process, but ensure that the benefit risk profiles in much more diverse populations are represented because often clinical trials are highly rigid and inclusion exclusion criteria prevent certain populations to be represented well in a clinical trial. Not only that, the period of time is short and some of the potential adverse reactions may not occur during that trial process. On top of detecting drug risks like these, it's also a very useful way to find interactions, contraindications, or also detect misuse of therapeutics on the market. On the positive side, many more researchers are starting to be able to use this data also to discover off-label treatment for new indications, particularly potentially in rare diseases, for example. Outside of the benefits and risks, it's also just a critical process needed to anticipate and drive early action by drug manufacturers for the regulatory and legal processes should a safety-related issue be detected. Because of the rise in the data sources as the volume, velocity, and, and variety of these data continue to grow, it's also one of the areas that there's a lot of interest in how we use AI and intelligent automation to streamline this process, which is highly manual. Typically, this is kind of broken down into how you do case ingestion and processing and then signal detection and processing. And you can see industry leaders across the board see great value, both in terms of costs, but also in benefit risk management for using AI or intelligent automation to process case or to detect and process the signals found in post-market safety data. But defining a signal is never easy. This is a flowchart that has nothing to do with safety data. In fact, it's how Slack decides whether or not to notify you of a message. And so something that we take is pretty simple is actually incredibly complicated. So this is way more simple though, if you compare it to what and how we use to determine if a spontaneously reported adverse event is actually a signal or particularly a novel signal that we need to alert someone about. So automation and, and the signal detection issues are not an easy area, even though it has great value. If you look at specifically some of the challenges, whether this is automated or done through data science manually, we have serious data quality issues. Conflicting data sources of which databases to use is just one part of it, but serious reporting biases based on populations or certain hospital systems, missing data, and then again, the increasing volume that's overwhelming some of the traditional statistical measures of disproportionality that we perform. On top of that data cleaning and manipulation with the medical coding and the processing aggregation, as well as duplications is a difficult area. So these three big components, quality, cleaning, analysis, and visualization is what we're going to address today in our demonstration. And the data we're gonna use it with today is from the FDA Adverse Event Reporting System. So here's just a quick view of the public dashboard, but we have a downloaded data set of these which we will walk through for an analysis summary today. And it, just a quick overview of what you're gonna see. Uh, Matt is going to play the role of our data engineer and show you some of the steps needed to take to do data processing and address quality and feature organization and engineering. After that, Georgia will take over the deep dive as a data scientist into some of the analytics and data visualization that are possible with these data sources. So of course, today we're gonna to be using Data IQ to show how this project can be implemented from start to finish. One of the unique components of Data IQ is that you actually can support a collaborative workbench for data engineers, data scientists, as well as present 
dashboards or applications for the drug safety experts that would need to consume this data to make actionable decisions based on safety signals or warnings detected. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Matt to begin our demo. Great. Thank you for that, Kelsey. So I'm Matt, I am a sales engineer with Data IQ, and for this session, I'm going to be acting as a data engineer. So what we can see on the screen at the moment is the FAIRS project homepage inside Data IQ. Now this is the standard Data IQ projects page, and we can see an overview of the project and the elements it contains. We also have the wiki, which in this instance, we're using as our Rosetta Stone to translate the data downloaded from the Advent reporting system so that it's humanly readable, including a translation of data sets from Kaggle into Data IQ and an overview of the acronyms included. So it's easy to understand from a project's perspective. If we jump through to the flow, we can see an overview of the project from start to finish. All the way on the left, we have the ingestion of data downloaded from Kaggle. All the way on the right, we have our machine learning modeling and our in insight creation. So let's take a look at the left hand side where we have our input files. We can see we're ingesting all of our data from Kaggle into our back end database using our sync recipe. Let's take a look at the patient demographic data set so we can take a look how raw data looks inside Data IQ. We can see from the data quality bars at the top, there's a mix of gray and gray and green, which means that there's a lot of missing data. So there's some work that we need to do before we can start using this data. Let's take a look at engineering this now. On the left hand side, we can see three yellow flow zones, different sections of the Data IQ project denoted to different parts of our data manipulation process. This is our patient flow zone, where we're transforming our patient data so it's both more human readable and also easier for the platform to develop insights from. Here we have a join recipe where Data IQ is joining two data sets, one with our outcome code and the other with our human translation of each code. We can see the output columns for our output data set, including our primary and case ID and our outcome meaning. If we take a look at the data set that this recipe is creating, we can see that for each case and primary ID, we have an outcome code and the human readable outcome meaning, which makes it really easy for us to understand exactly what the outcome of a particular case is. Next, we have to do some final preparation of our demographic data. This is the prepare recipe where we can perform any number of different transformations to our data in a visual step-by-step -step manner. We can see we've got three steps on the left-hand side. The first is to remove nine columns, which we don't need for our project. The second is to create a new column to understand if the reporter is in the same country as our occurrence. And the next is to re remove any rows where the age does not equal anything between zero and 100. This will rapidly reduce our data set to cases that have an age assigned. If we head back to the flow, if we head back to the flow, we can take a look at the final data set that we're creating in this particular flow zone. This concludes information about each patient, the outcome, and some information about the company producing the drug. We can dig a little bit further and analyze the data right from inside the data set. So here we can take a look at outcome meaning and analyze. And we can see the distribution of each of the outcomes across the entire data set. So we have a count of each outcome and the percentage across the sample. If I want to dive in a little bit deeper into this, I can also create a chart right from inside the data set. So if I create count of records with outcome meaning and change this to pi, I can see really simply and easily the distribution across our sample data set and understand exactly which outcomes are the most common for our data. In this case, it's other serious. So now we've taken a look at our patient information. We head back to the flow and take a look at our drug flow zone. With our drug information, we can see that there's a lot of missing information from each of the port from the reporters of each entry. And it's clear we need to do some work with this data set before we can use the data efficiently. If we take a look at end date, for example, we can see that over 60% of the entries are empty. Now this could mean that our cases are still ongoing, so it could be relevant information. What we need to do now is we need to go ahead and create some information that the machine can read easily. This is a code recipe inside Data IQ. 
this is where we are transforming our data using code. And this particular recipe is taking our start and end dates and it's translating that into a simple and easy format for the computer to understand. If we take a look at the, the source data set, we can see that we've also got the start and end date columns now in this data set. This is in a computer readable format, but also it allows us to compute the duration of the course of treatment further on into the project. If we head back to our flow zone, the next thing we need to take a look at is feature organization. So we can see from this flow zone that we're taking four data sets and we're creating our drug diagnosis information data set. Here, we're joining our treatment dates with our drug information based on primary and case ID. And we're keeping these columns from drug information and also our information around our, our drug treatments. Next, we're joining our diagnosis information from the medical dictionary and our patient info on the same primary and case IDs. And we are keeping columns from both data sets, including our indication and our patient information. Finally, before we complete the last join in this flow zone, we need to take a look at applying some filtering on a random sample of 15%. This is because our data set is quite large. If we look at the patient data set, for example, we can see that there are around 8 million records included. For the remainder of this session, we're going to be working on a reduced number through the filter recipe, taking our records from 8 million to around 1.2 million. This gives us a large sample size to compute for accurate analysis, but also optimizes our data set for size. Now, this can be achieved really simply and easily by deploying a filter recipe to the flow and telling DataRaku the percentage of which we need to reduce by. Now we have our final drug diagnosis data set. We can head over to data quality. There are two separate streams within this flow zone. The first is where we use logic to remove any duplicates as an example for the session to show the amount in which a data set can be reduced. The logic behind this is we know that there will be duplicate entries for a case depending on the method in which the case was reported, whether that be through a consultant, a family doctor or a pharmacist. We're then taking a look at all of the cases for each primary ID indicated here, assessing if the demographics are the same in which we can deduce they mention the same case and only keep separate records removing duplicate entries for each patient and separating them out into a duplicate data set. If we take a look at the initial data set, we can see that we are looking at a total of 5,755 rows for this particular primary ID. However, after applying the logic in the code recipe, we can see that this is reduced to just 49 distinct treatment cycles for each case. The second stream ensures that we're only keeping relevant data from our data set ready for generating insights. From the source data, we know that many of the entries don't include much of the data needed to produce these insights. So instead of keeping these features that may negatively affect our project and our performance of modeling later on, we're going to filter these out. Firstly, we're going to group the data based on several keys, including the primary and case ID, as well as the demographics of our patient. We're going to apply some aggregations here as well and include only the last entry for each of the groups produced. This produces a data set that includes much of the information about each case as possible, including demographics and drug information. Now we're ready to start gathering insights from our data. I'm going to pass over to Georgia now, our data scientist, who's going to talk us through the rest of our project. Thank you very much, Matt. So I'm Georgia Cuyales, a data scientist, and moving forward, we will spend some more time on the insights and data analytics. So far, we applied data mining and cleaning and further quality improvements to a data set that consists, as you also, um, on multiple information from different sources. To get the first insights at a glance, I'll go to back to the dashboards where we have all the visualizations and more information about the models as well. And here we replicated the FARS official dashboard that was shown on Kelsey's slides as well with a concentration of a sample of almost 800,000 records for the last mostly records of the last five years. Now in the dashboard tab, you can see a dash web up that runs in the background, which shows report records by sex, by age, seriousness, reporter, report type, and reporter country. 
quick remarks here is that in terms of seriousness, hospitalization, death, and disability are usual outcomes. And also from the reporter, reporter type, uh, most of the reports are recorded by physicians and health professionals. Now the second tab where we have signal, a bit of signal analysis, the graph shows the percentage of several adverse events on the rows with the different drugs columns that are individually linked. The ones that the frequency is low might indicate irregular events linked to specific drugs. Now, both graphs in this dashboard show common versus uncommon occurrences of the data. These are case-only insights that we see with the naked eye. We can't really make any signal conclusions based on this. Hence, to scientifically analyze and evidence potential signals, we use classic statistical methods. And now moving back to the wiki, where Matt showed you some information on the project, there is a data analytics article here, which shows a common approach to detect irregular signals called the measures of disproportionality used widely by the community. Now the contingency table generates the proportional analysis for each drug of interest and adverse event pair. Now, moreover, statistical metrics as reporting odds ratio, proportional reporting ratio, here is how we generate them. They quantify associations between those pairs of drugs and adverse events. But let's return back to the flow to show you an example on how we utilize these metrics in the bigger scheme of this work that we present today in the seminar. Back to the dashboard. Here, Matt showed you the recipes and the code recipes as well. The red ones is what we call plugins. So we implemented the logic on the disproportionate measures of disproportionality, and we built a reusable plugin based on Python functions and JSON files. The user only interacts with a UI interface and may select a combination of a drug and an adverse event. And there's several adverse events as well presented in our data. Now the plugin, if we run this plugin, it automatically generates a table that records the frequency of the chosen pair um, of drug and an adverse event. So for example, um, omeprazole drug, which is known to be used for gastroesophageal reflux diseases. In this data set, it has some unexpected, I would say, link in six reports to an inf inflammatory disease with skin and muscle reactions. Additionally, we see the density of this event to all the other drugs, and also the relation of this drug to all the other events and all the other records in this specific data set that we work in this sample of data that we work with um, in this project. Now, the second part of this plugin, uh, the component of this plugin, it uses the contingency table and computes the statistical metrics. For example, proportional reporting ratio and reporting out ratio measures will return higher score when a particular drug in a, is associated with a specific adverse event higher than expected relative to the input database and the records. So you can easily check individual pairs and cases in this part. Now to generalize this, we build another plugin, which is this plugin here, that computes the distribution of multiple drugs and adverse events. So here you just give the name of the drug column adverse event and you select how many adverse events and drugs you want to generate the statistics. And the output of this drug is for each case we have at the end the statistics and also confidence intervals. Now in several research papers, the confidence interval of these metrics set on a threshold limit underline an indication of the strength of a prospective signal. So we use, like, I mean, to, this, to further detect prospective signals, we combine the statistical metrics and machine learning algorithms. So moving now to the machine learning and uh, predictive analytics part, and to be more precise on what is the logic that we implement here, compute a column where the 95% lower confidence interval of the reporting odd ratio provides a sign on, of warning if its value is greater than one. So if this is greater than one, we generate a column uh, that this is a potential signal. You will see some of them further down or not. Also, we do some feature, oops, we do some feature engineering again on the, on the demographics uh, 
data and feature, and we create a column on whether an indication it was known or not for this specific case. So we feed this data now into the lab to predict if, if, if an event is, if a record is a warning or not. So going into our lab inside the DSS platform, just very briefly, you can easily design uh, different machine learning sessions. You can select the target, the target is the signal, different features, but also multiple uh, classification algorithms and the hyperparameter. Here we run in parallel some decision tree based algorithms and we present the results. Now the data set also, something important to mention is filter for a specific drug, the, the predictive analysis that we do, which is prednisone. In this here, another remark to make is that we use demographic data that we know in advance of any research and any adverse event and signal detection, because we want to see what are the relation of these features to a potential warning and to analyze these populations. I won't spend too much time here because I will show you the rest in the results of this session that we publish in a visual dashboard. But going to back to the flow that there, you will see that there is two machine learning session. So independently, we run an anomaly detection session on the same data set by using unsupervised learning clustering and specifically isolation forest. Now the data set records are labeled now as regular or anomalies. So the purpose of both machine learning sessions is to explore populations in higher risk and also check if there are any correlations observed between records recorded as anomalies and the ones predicted as warnings based on the statistics. So let's go to the dashboard now. Oh, sorry, to the dashboard on the wiki, not the wiki, and explain some of these, some of these modeling results. Now, so interestingly, there is what we call interactive scoring that you can see the impact of changing a given feature value on the prediction of a warning that our model generates. For example, I'll turn on the sets here. We can see if it is a female or a male, what is the percentage of a potential warning or not? Also, we can do different what if case analysis scenarios and see if a person is a male and is within this age age range, if there is a higher or a lower percentage for this drug to observe a potential signal and same as country as well. Now on the next step, now that we see the decision tree, this tree displays the underlying classification model and the main features, for example, the sets that drive branching decisions due to a range that has more impact on distinguishing population into the two classes that we are predicting. So these are, and you can just go on and forth and see the different analysis. On the anomaly detection tab, it is worth exploring the subpopulation analysis. Now, in terms of, for example, and I will go back to the indication, but in terms of the age, for example, we see that in the anomalies, the age of 20 and 30, they're more prompt into fall into the category of anomalies by taking this specific drug. Interesting now on the indication, just from the domain point of view, prednisone is known to treat conditions such as breathing problems and severe allergies and skin disease. Interestingly, the model shows, and I will just go back and hear the, the concentration, shows us COVID as one of the conditions that may lead to irregularities and warnings. Some remarks to make here is that breathing problems were also side effects of COVID. Hence, this drug medication could have been prescribed even if there was not enough research or any potential sign back to the time. Moreover, I mean, during COVID, numerous patients maybe were unable to visit clinics for a proper diagnosis and a lot of indication were recorded purely as COVID. And as Kelsey mentioned, that is a factor that has certainly shuffled the research for capturing signals and data around that period of time. Now, last but not least, to verify these two methods, we visualize the percentage of, the percentage of warnings for data labeled as anomalies. So this is the percentage of warnings. And then we show how much of this our algorithm has captured as prediction to be um, a warning or not. So it seems that the algorithm captures more anomalies to be potential warnings as opposed to the regular data. So this graph concludes the insights of the work we present in this seminar. And I will move now to the last part 
to discuss a bit conclusion and future work before we go back to Chelsea. Now to summarize the motive of the work is first of all to apply data mining and cleaning techniques to a very big public data set. Secondly, we combine statistical methods and machine learning to first provide a baseline warning for further validation of a signal, but also to analyze the correlation of demographic features and generate subpopulation analysis for groups higher at risk. And then last but not least, we present visual insights with a user-friendly interface via dashboard and, and a web app as well. In terms of what's next for us and what is interesting here is that further we would like to ingest drug labels with open FDA API. Through the labels, we can use NLP or even computer vision methods to identify if an adverse event is listed as a side effect of each drug. Now, based on this condition, the records can be classified as positive or negative. And then there is, again, a lot of work on this where machine learning models can be further used to build an algorithm for scoring new records and detecting new safety signals as opposed to the ones that are well known. Also, we would like to ideally compare quality across different spontaneously reported databases. Data IQ pipelines would pull, clean, and integrate data from public and government sources. Here we're using FDA FARS, there's FDA VARS, WHO, and also different European databases, EMA and UVDAS reporting systems. And this is some good research. There is a lot of research actually on overlap of quality of signals from different databases that we would like to implement in the platform as well. And then there is a lot of exciting research on leveraging social media and networks. It seems that people are more inclined to share their treatment experiences on social media, posting their use of prescription drugs and related side effects. So we would like to ideally create corpuses and use advanced linguistic features to match drug name, diagnose conditions and side effects and further explore that path for signal detection. So to conclude, both standard methods that we use in this work are relevant to the huge ongoing work around signal detection, but also new exciting paths push the boundaries of technologies in this field. I will get back to Kelsey now that can conclude and open up the, the session for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia and Matt, for that uh, wonderful demo showing how Data IQ with this project can be used both in terms of data processing, cleaning, and feature engineering, as well as applying both some of the very standard statistical methodologies like disproportionality metrics, as well as some of the more modern applications of supervised and unsupervised machine learning. As Georgia had mentioned, there's a lot of interest in evolving methodology driven by the changing landscapes of the data largely. Of course, many of the research is focused on how we can increase the use of more supervised machine learning to help automate this signal detection, triaging, and actionable alerts. Of course, one of the areas we're really interested in is, is using the drug label so we actually can further classify novel detections versus known signals found from earlier clinical research. There's also quite a lot of interest in how to apply graph or network-based analogy of methodologies, largely ways that you can incorporate the known similarities between therapeutics, diseases, and indications, even to the point of exploring biological pathways and how we look at that for either off-label use or drug interactions. As Georgia also mentioned, it's a very hot topic right now of how to include something outside of these curated spontaneously reported adverse event databases, social media, as well as EHR systems being some of them. Of course, those will also come with their whole new host of challenges. Right now, about, I would say, over 50% of signals that lead to actionable change in a drug label or in a recall are found in the spontaneously curated databases. But social media is an avenue and a channel where many people may be more willing to share. Of course, the size of that data, I think less than 0.2% of social media posts have they found medical information in. So we have new challenges with that data. Of course, slang and the, the ways of medical coding will be challenging, but there are a lot of exciting areas there. All of these in general are, are ways to try to streamline and better detect these safety signals that 
ensure patient safety in post-market research with drugs. So with that, though, we'd like to move over to any questions you have and open up the floor to discussions. Thank you all for your attention and looking forward to the questions you have. Right. Um, thank you for those that are still on and listening. And we would like to now move over into the Q and A session. So, just a recap here. You know, we saw some of this. I gave an overview around pharmacovigilance and the the value and important of that for this field. Um, and then Matt going through some of the data engineering, data processing, data manipulation that's possible with data IQ. And then, of course, Georgia in the modeling. So, um, please feel free to use the question mark to ask any questions to us. Um, looking forward to comments or discussion. Okay, we got we got one, so that's good. We got one that came in and we might've just lost Matt, but um, so this question is to Georgia asking around um, one of the steps you showed two different machine learning models can you talk a little bit more about the differences of those two models that you used and what you were evaluating with them? Yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, there is two different individual session. The one session is applying um, anomaly detection, which is unsupervised machine learning on the data set. What we, we, what we use is isolation forest for the unsupervised learning uh, and that part, which very much isolates observations by creating a random forest of trees, um, each splitting samples in different partitions. So anomalies tend to have, you know, much shorter paths from the root of the trees. And this is very much how they are um, classified as anomalies or not by using this algorithm. Uh, we did some hyperparameter tuning as uh, information as like number of, we set the number of trees to be uh, 200 in this case. Uh, also, for that session, to reduce the variance of, of the decision trees, uh, we deploy bootstrapping as well that creates subsets of the data from the from the training sample uh, chosen randomly with, repl with replacement each time. So that is the one session to detect anomalies or not. There is another session which is um, individually applied uh, for the classification of potential warnings or not. For that session, we use a random forest with hyperparameter tuning again on maximum number of trees, maximum depth, and minimum minimum number of leaves. And the strategy for optimizing the hyperparameter is grid search on a k-fold cross-validation. We, we set up five folds. We also for so and for the classification, we tried actually uh, multiple multiple algorithms. I think as you saw in the video, we tried XGBoost as well and decision trees. Oh, uh, Georgia, I think we lost your audio. Can you oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry. So yeah, I was saying that for the classification, actually we use this uh, XG boost and decision trees, uh, but random forest is performing better. The metrics that we use for un random forest to compare the algorithms is uh, the area under the curve, which is a um, standard summary metric for comparison uh, of all the possible thresholds in ROC analysis. Uh, and then for them, and then for the anomaly detection, we use the silhouette silhouette method for uh, for the scoring. And for all of them on the evaluation, we test that we split the data into a um, train and test set that we do. We apply like the evaluation and the different metrics for comparison. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Um, and we had a follow up to that uh, question. So it said, since this was an anomaly detection, I'm assuming the data set was imbalanced. What are you using in data IQ to handle that? So there is, um, so the, usually the data set is imbalanced. To be fair, actually in this specific, because we filter for a specific drug, um, I would say that it was I mean, just it happened that for this to be fairly balanced, but the methods that we used for imbalanced data sets for these were similar problems is resampling of data. So in that I could specifically, the method that is implemented as part of the lab is um, undersampling. 
And then there is, I mean, more sophisticated techniques. You can always, um, you always have the option to um, apply custom techniques as a synthetic minority, um, like smooth techniques or oversampling, depending on how big or how small your data set is. Thank you. Um, and more good questions coming through. We have another one here. Um, let me check that one out. Um, can you specifically talk about how Dataiku helps create an explainable trail for scientists to understand these adverse reactions and how the model made the associations? Um, Matt, maybe you want to start with this one around, you know, as you introduce the project, talk about what the project is and some of the features of the product project in terms of explainability. But then, uh, George, also, if you want to chime in around some of the explainability of the models you showed. Yeah, of course. So from from a platform perspective, um, everything everything is handled from a visual perspective from a left to right. So we can see this trail exactly explaining what data sets are coming in, how we're transforming this data, how we're applying modeling and the data sets that we've got coming out. So we can see exactly what point what has changed in a particular project from a modeling perspective and from an association perspective. That part of the question over to Georgia from a modeling perspective, <clears throat> but from a project perspective, we can see visually how the data has changed as we go along. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, so from the modeling perspective, when it comes to explainability of their results and how that is linked to adverse events, um, as I have showed to the dashboard, we have things as feature... So once you generate, like once you generate sessions and you, you decide which model performs better and which model which model to deploy on the on the flow um i, w I would um some important some important uh parts of the tool that helps you to explain what is happening the one is feature importance so the aim of this project from the beginning was to understand which features might be and, and especially the ones that we know beforehand when it comes to demographics or uh what was the diagnosis for an event on their specific track so feature importance can help you to see which which ones are strongly related to a potential warning or not. Um, so that's the one tool. The other tool, when it comes, which is a bit more linked to the algorithms, is you can see the tree, how the tree is created based on the range um, of, the, of the features that help you to take uh, more clear decisions. But also um, subpopulation, anomalies, subpopulation analysis in the anomaly detection, where you can see for each different um, feature, uh, the different populations, uh, and through the interactive scoring as well, if someone's a male or a female, what is the probability that our algorithm will predict either an anomaly or a warning? Um, and also different age ranges, age um, like between now, and, and we did some binning of like 10 to 20, 20 to 30, but again, to see which uh, age groups are more prone to a potential adverse event under a specific drug. And also the side effects, which was like an interesting bit of comment. And all these, uh, they are generated automatically uh, with the results of the, of the session and the algorithms that you are running, and you can publish them on a dashboard or even export some of the visualizations locally. Yeah, and as Georgia had shown, um, the dashboarding capabilities of Data Aku are really nice because this doesn't have to be something that gets handed off to the business users or to a pharmacovigilance officer or a scientist. They can use the platform themselves with those dashboardings to explore the data, explore the models um, with governance. Um, some of the things we didn't show of the platform are the ability for audit and logging, um, as well as setting in data metrics and data checks. So you can actually set up data scenarios to ensure quality, accuracy of the data, as well as complete traceability and reproducibility. Um, and with our Govern node, we have the capability, once you do have a model that you might push out into production through MLOps capabilities, for example, um, to to manage that risk model and 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 govern how the performance of that model is um, in operation, so that you can make actionable actionable decisions from that. Um, so it looks like a a bit of a follow up question, I think, to that too. We just had is is there a way to see the changes to the product or undo changes or track changes in projects as they develop? 
Yeah, awesome. So I'll take that one. Um, so from a platform perspective, Zotrego is built on a Git repository as a backend. So all of the changes to a project, any commits to um, a data set or to a model are held in memory in the Git repository. And we can revert back either to those changes or the entire project to a point before those changes are made. So protecting your data sets, protecting the modeling, protecting the output of the project. Um, if a incorrect commit has been made to a particular data set or transformation. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> See if any other questions come through. Um, this, this one is more on the domain side. So uh, as we mentioned at the end, we'd mentioned the idea of social media or next steps. So do you really think social media data can improve or change signal detection methods in pharmacovigilance. Um, I'll answer this, but also Georgia might want to answer this a little bit too. I think that you know one of the things as we consider some of the new data sources we would use for drug safety surveillance, um, particularly in post-market situations where we have this case only kind of spontaneous reporting situation, the methodologies would have to change pretty drastically. Um, I think I, I, about over 50% of signals currently are detected through these spontaneously reported curated databases. Um, as we move to try to incorporate social media, yes, we might have more natural response from patients. We have the proclivity to have more honest feedback about what's happening, but um, it's also incredibly difficult because of slang. So medical coding is suddenly difficult. There's already a lot of research in just the diverse quality of the data, whether it's submitted from a hospital, patient reported versus manufacturer. So if we bring in the idea of social media, one, there's the fact that very few posts are actually about um, medical conditions. I think 0.02% is, is actually medically relevant. Um, there's also a problem of like the how long data would list uh, exist in some of these systems. So you can't really do a lot of historical mm -hmm. analysis because much of social media posts get deleted or erased. Um, so while I think that there is a lot of options, I think the biggest thing it'll do is drive new methodology. Um, I, for example, am more excited around, you know, NLP instead of on social media, but using it on open drug on drug labels to incorporate novel versus known signals, as well as some of the other condition or information on drug labels, like, um, you know, other indications, the compounds, biomarkers, and this idea of starting to build more of like similarity networks around multiple components of drugs, um, not only when you're surveilling it for safety, but also for potential reuse. Uh, Georgia, do you want to add anything to that? Okay, Kelsey, I think Marla, you have covered everything. Uh as you mentioned, from the technology point of view, I think the social media, there is the aspect that maybe people are, uh, I mean, people actually tend much more now to share their uh, their opinion or their feedback through social media. So there is a lot of material there. Uh, of course, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to the validity or how to distinguish through wording, what is the medical condition? What is the drug? What is the adverse event? That's That's a very big challenge. At the moment, as you mentioned, Kelsey, I mean, statistical methods are very much what is widely used, machine learning incorporated through drugs, through the databases. The social media is more like a new way of pushing the boundaries of technology in the pharma industry, which is, I think, very interesting from the data science point of view for us to see uh, by using linguistic, by connecting uh, through APIs to these to the, to the social media how we can extend the research. I wouldn't say necessarily they will improve it or it will make it much better. It's more exploring that path. Thanks, Georgia. Um, this next question, we got another one to, I think Matt might cover this or you both might cover this a bit. Um, you know, Matt, you showed some charts and then of course, uh, Georgia, you showed some of the dashboards but can we integrate other external visualization tools with data who like Power BI? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. So we understand that customers have their own workflows in place in terms of visualization. A lot of these reports are standardized, uh, reporting back to the business to change these would introduce a lot of stress, especially in terms of pharma and manufacturing. Um, so we've 
designed some plugins available that connect out natively to uh, Power BI and Tableau, amongst some others. So we can move data sets right from inside the interface straight into Power BI and into other visualization tools that allow you to then create those insights in a way that you're familiar with in terms of your workflow. Um, this doesn't just extend out to data sets. There are different there are different availabilities in terms of dashboarding and things like that. We can export out to different formats into different tools. Um, Georgia, I don't know if you've got anything to add there, but yes, the capability is available. Yeah, no, I, mean, I think Matthew covered it. It's, it is available. There are different options. And I mean, that ICO is a platform that you can do all and everything from analytics to models and visualization. But of course, you have your own tools in different organizations and we want to make sure that you're you know, reusing uh, as much as you have. Of course, that ICO can always be, like this is platform can always be used for all the analytics, the cleaning, the modeling, and then you can export the final data set and do interactive visualization as you're used to. Great. Uh, I'll also add on to that question, uh, kind of the opposite direction. It says, what are the different data source connections or connectors available with Dataiku? Yeah, I'll take that one again. So from a data connectivity perspective, we've got uh, over 25 native data source connections right out of the box. So including BigQuery, SQL databases, Hadoop, even reaching out to things like cloud storage or some FTP servers that you have running uh, on premise. Um, we're agnostic to where your data comes from or what format the data is in effectively. So bringing that data in from multiple different sources in the same project is something that's quite valuable as well. So regardless of where your data sits, if it is effective in a particular project, we can bring that into the project in a single interface and manipulate it in the same way. Um, so really acting as that overarching layer across all of your data, um, all of the data sources, allowing transformations in a visual way, um, regardless of where the data sits. Awesome. Um, yeah, and I think one of the things we did show this is just something from with Kaggle, but of course we could use APIs and many of the other ways to curate some of the data from the public sources. So, um, okay, so this one, I think we've covered it a little, we've talked a bit about it, particularly when we talked about other sources of data, but um, what other data mining algorithms could we use to detect like signals from spontaneous reporting systems and um, what else exists in Dataiku that we could use for that? I can, yeah, I can take that. Um, so uh, I mean, in, in this, uh, in, I mean, in this project, we use uh, statistical methods, reporting odd ratios and reporting and proportional reporting uh, ratio. It is, I, I would say that we, like by reading the literature on what is being applied at the moment, there is a lot around Bayesian statistical models, Bayesian confidence, proportional neural nets, uh, linked to information component, uh, but also like gamma Poisson uh, distribution linked to empirical based um, geometric mean. Uh, besides that, so these are like two, again, widely used methods, but of course, besides that, uh, we discuss a bit about extending into uh, the labels uh, of the drugs. So that brings in natural language processing. On top of that, we saw different methods of applying tree search algorithms as we did, but also neural nets for the classification for the, for the signal detection uh, in the adverse events. We can't hear you, Joe. It happened once in every call, right? <laughs> um, I think we're nearing the top of the hour. I don't see any more questions coming in yet. If someone wants to quickly ask anything else, otherwise we can uh, give you five minutes of your day back, early lunchtime for those that are on the East Coast at least. <laughs> Thank you, Matt, for joining from the UK. Dinner time for you. So we'll let you go eat. All right, great. Well, um, thank you all again, and hope this session was both informative as well as uh, interesting around some of the things that Dataiku can do looking at this drug safety surveillance type of data. Um, any follow-up questions, we're happy to take and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank, thank you very much. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye.